Well, thank you. Thank you also for for being in the room. <laughs> it's a uh, a long day, um, and um, I'm I'm happy to be here to um, provide a, a report on. Um, this uh, consortium that I was fortunate enough to be a part of. Um, so it was called the Scientific Integrity Consortium. And uh, the consortium came up with a, a publication, which I will be talking about, and some principles and best practices for scientific integrity, which I will outline um, throughout my talk. So again, I was asked to uh, provide a disclosure statement. So this is uh, just who I work for and who I've uh, done some consulting with and who's funded my, my grants um, over the last uh, five years. Um, but most of what I'm going to be talking about today is actually in this publication. And so the opinions of the consortium uh, as opposed uh, to personal opinions, although I was a, a part of the consortium. So we're just going to start with some basic definitions when it comes to scientific integrity, because that's a, I find a big word that, you know, has a lot of different meanings when you ask individuals. So we're going to, when we talk here about scientific integrity, we're talking about when persons uh, adhere to accepted standards and professional values and practices. Um, of the relevant scientific community because it may differ a little bit uh, with different uh, areas of, of science. We talk about research misconduct or research breaches. This is where we're talking about fabrication, making up data, falsification, or plagiarizing in either proposing that research or performing that research or reviewing the research or reporting the, the, the results. Um, within this context, it's not an honest error. Somebody's made a mistake, they transposed a, a, a data point or something like that. Or if it's a difference of opinion, which as you know can happen when two people view the exactly the same data, and you might uh, be, be coming up with different opinions of what that data mean. That's not um, fault, that doesn't fall under the, the misconduct. Um, detrimental or questionable research practices are when researchers commit research misconduct uh, that damages research and strays from the norms of, of appropriate um, practices of science. And um, in some areas, um, so in, in, our doc in our document, our publication, we, we use this detrimental or questionable research practices. In Canada and abroad, they use questionable research um, practices. So one of the reasons why um, this, this came about, I mean, scientific integrity in the current landscape of doing science is increasingly complex. Um, the 21st century scientist works in a research environment that is being transformed by globalization, by interdisciplinary research projects of the kinds that we're talking about here, very large and complicated. It's team science and, and we are uh, inundated with different uh, technologies that are moving very, very rapidly. Um, and I was in the... Um, Journal of Food Protection uh, management meeting yesterday, and certainly uh, some of these very technologies that that pertain to publishing research are having significant impact on on the Journal uh, of Food Protection. So, in this uh, scientific integrity ecosystem, um, there's multiple layers of what we're talking about, and the principles and the best practices. Um, the consortium looked at these multiple layers, um, and really when we're talking about this, we're talking about all of, all of these parts. Um, so we're talking about individual researchers um, as we are uh, either at the bench or, in, in my case, um, as a, a, a PI, uh, the people I mentor um, who are at the bench, uh, research supervisors, um, institutional leaders as a department chair. I've uh, spent a lot of time reflecting on the output of this manuscript and, and what it means as a, 
as a department chair or a leader in academia of what I should be doing in my department, not only to, uh, to make sure that my faculty um, have the right tools uh, to, to deal with this, or that, that the students within my department have, have the right tools. Uh, but there's also research funders at the broader perspective, and then getting back to things like the Journal of Food Protection, it's, it's um, the editors at the journal, it's the peer reviewers, and it's the decisions that are made um, in, in evaluating uh, work and um, looking at the publication of that work, ensuring that it's fairly reviewed, um, and looking at um, publication of a, a broad scope of research that includes both um, positive or expected data and, and unexpected data. So this um, Scientific Integrity Consortium was made up of the following um, groups of individuals, and I'll go through each of these um, separately just to give you an idea of the scope of, of people we had in the room to, to discuss uh, this. So in, in professional societies, you can see the list of professional societies here, and the reason I was involved um, was because it happened to coincide with the year that I was president of IAFP. So um, the president of IFT at the time, the president of the various associations here were invited to participate, and so I was fortunate enough um, in the spring of 2017 to be invited uh, to participate um, with ILSI and um, the American Academy of Sciences. Um, so as in addition, um, universities were represented um, by either deans or um, other individuals from, from those universities. And then, as I mentioned, the National Academy of Sciences, um, various uh, groups within uh, the National Academy of Sciences. And then finally, we had representation from um, both Canadian uh, government agencies and uh, the U.S. government, including the Office of Research Integrity um, within the, the U.S. government and the Secretariat on Responsible Con Conduct of Research um, from the Government of Canada. So a very broad perspective uh, of individuals who both had uh, a lot of experience um, in discussing or dealing with this a particular area or topic of conversation, scientific integrity, and then others uh, like myself, where uh, perhaps it was uh, something newer for me to spend a lot of time thinking about. So uh, I really appreciated the opportunity, as I mentioned. So in um, the spring of this year, in April of 2019, um, the, a, a journal, Science and Engineering Ethics, published uh, the manuscript, and you can see Allison, who's in the room, uh, from ILSI, um, was the lead author on this manuscript, and you can see the, um, the other authors um, that participated. Um, as of, I think, a week ago, um, there were uh, 2,600 uh, downloads, uh, 38 shares of the article, and already um, one citation. So uh, we know people are looking at uh, the article and, and uh, uh, considering it. So let's go into a little bit of detail on, on what our overarching principles were and then the, uh, the best practices that we recommended. So, in the um, overarching principles, the, there were two. The first one was foster a culture of integrity in the uh, scientific process, and we'll go into more detail on this. And then uh, a statement in, in the, the second overarching principle is that evidence-based policy interests um, may have legitimate roles in playing influencing aspects of the research project, either by uh, defining what uh, the research needs are or providing funding for, for certain areas of research, but that those roles 
should not interfere with scientific integrity. They should not influence how an experiment is set up or how um, the results are uh, evaluated. Um, so the, the science needs to be solid and independent of uh, these policy interests that, that might want uh, the, the data or the data outcomes. So then as mentioned, um, the, well, I guess I guess. I didn't realize, I forgot, I had this slide up. <laughs> so uh, principle one, in more detail. Um, so I'll uh, foster a culture of uh, scientific in uh, integrity in the scientific process. So institutions should develop policies, procedures, and practices that address scientific integrity and uh, provide training and work to, to maintain awareness and advocacy for these practices. And this is where I can put on my um, department chair hat and say that uh, probably right now in my institution, in my department, we're not doing enough in this area. And that's something that I'm uh, committed to, uh, to change uh, in my remaining term as, as chair. Um, and this, you know, has a plays in the way in which we traditionally have trained in, in this, these principles in that in some cases not at, at all. Um, and that many of us, uh, you know, use the mentorship model of training in how to do science. So we, uh, as I was mentioned earlier, we, we go to school, we get a, a good solid education in how to do science. Um, but we don't necessarily get education in, um, or traditionally haven't gotten education in scientific integrity and what that means and how to properly set up an experiment and a focus on, on uh, statistics. And so that's really um, hit and miss in some cases in some institutions and in some, in, in some laboratories. And so uh, this area, this, this principle really was, was founded on um, having that uh, perhaps increase the consistency and increase the uh, ubiquity of training uh, across uh, campuses, across the system in, um, in this particular area. So as, as I mentioned, principle number two, this addresses the interface of science and policy. And as I perhaps mentioned a little bit too much earlier on, the ultimate use of science in public policy, uh, as it, well as in decision making and in public opinion should not affect the content of the science. And so it's recognizing how these two work together and how that they, um, they need to, to be se uh, appropriately uh, separate and allow the science uh, to be uh, solid and um, uh, uh, done with integrity and uh, consistency. So nine best practices for scientific integrity. Um, these best practices include um, requiring universal training in scientific methods. And this is in things like experimental design, uh, statistical analysis, uh, responsible research, uh, promoting research quality, uh, number two is strengthening the scientific integrity oversight and ethics training at various institutions. And so this is including strengthening institu institutional capacity for dealing with research breaches um, and uh, a proposal for consideration of a research integrity advisory board. Uh, number three was to encourage reproducibility through transparency. And this is uh, a movement I think is, is going on, and, and again, we were discussing this in the Journal of Food Protection meeting yesterday on this movement to an open scientific uh, framework so that um, in the traditional publication where you where you have your methods and your results and and you you have a summary of your results 
You know, increasingly, we're adding supplemental data, um, and now the movement is beyond uh, supplemental data, but but providing your raw data in a in a permanent database that is tied to your manuscript by an independent DOI. So uh, be, to allow others to then reevaluate your data or access your data and to, to reproduce it um, if they need to or want to, or reproduce your evaluation of the same data. Uh, I think that that's a, um, you know, a tr something that we, we need to embrace and something that ne not necessarily we, and, and I can speak for myself, not traditionally this is not something I have done. And so it is something, again, from this process, um, I'm moving towards uh, a commitment that, that in my laboratory, when we publish, we'll be, we'll be uh, uploading our raw data as a, as a just uh, thing that we do. Um, so establish um, open science as the norm. Again, uh, data sharing, um, open access policies. Um, and, and uh, of course, there are uh, issues with things like uh, IP. Um, number five is to develop tools uh, to teach communi communication skills to uphold uh, scientific integrity. And this has a lot to do with a training component within a science program that uh, focuses on communication of research. And as most of you know, in food safety microbiology, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to accurately communicate concepts of risk and uh, relative risk and um, we're talking about things that most people cannot see and understand, and so being able to communicate it accurately and in balance uh, is, is a skill that is um, important to teach. And I think traditionally, again, we haven't perhaps spent as much time on that. Um, I think that the, the things that the student group is doing, like the three-minute uh, thesis competition, it are, are you know, one small part of that kind of uh, training in order to communicate con concepts that are complex into language that media, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and other means of communication that we're being encouraged to communicate our research um, on or those platforms that we're able to do it in a way that um, is helpful as opposed to harmful. Um, and the, the insurance of approval of press releases, um, uh, I think, comes at, at a criticism, perhaps, um, of some perhaps exuberant uh, academic or government press uh, communication um, divisions that haven't perhaps checked with um, scientists to make sure that the message that they were transmitting to the public uh, was an accurate reflection of, of the research actually done. And then, of course, uh, a long discussion on strengthening the, the, the peer review process and what that means in the traditional process. And as many of you know who um, are regularly submitting manuscripts for um, peer review or being asked to review other manuscripts, that this is a, a, a dynamic area where it is changing to open concepts of um, uh, peer review where it's more of a collaborative um, effort where the the, the people who are being reviewed know who are reviewing them and, and, and get a chance to, um, to, to discuss back and forth. Um, but also things like conflict of interest, um, checklists that focus on the, the science and the setup of the, of the research and the evaluation of the research. And then again, a trend that I think is already happening is um, an increase in recognition of review activities and how time consuming they are, how important they are to the process. And so actually giving recognition uh, to those in particular who spend a lot of time reviewing other people's manuscripts and doing a, you know, a, a thorough um, job of, of doing it. Um, number seven is encouraging publication of 
unanticipated findings, and, and I was careful earlier not to say negative findings. So we, we were very specific about um, not using the word negative, you know, where you have a hypothesis and, and you get results that, that don't support it. Um, and the traditional thinking is, well, that's not publishable because the results were negative. And, and so we, we pr pr preferred to use the word unanticipated. So you had a hypothesis, you got different results, we were unanticipated, and that they should be published because um, if you only publish the positive, then there's a lot of research that perhaps gets repeated over and over and over again because other people have the same ideas that you had and, and aren't aware that that research um, uh, has been done, and, and also it, 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 it uh, puts an uh, imbalance on the, uh, the positive research that is published, if that's the only research that's published. So removal of publication um, biased, and as I mentioned, I'm getting ahead of myself on all these slides, uh, a change in terminology from unanticipated versus negative. Um, there was a, a feeling, um, and so this is number eight, where there should be better harmonization of, of how different journals are handling retraction or correction of papers and how that is tied to, um, you know, when you download a paper and how do you know that it, it's been retracted at a later date or that there's been a change of substance that's been made at a, at, at a later date. So um, having some sort of standardization where, where every, it would be a level playing field and everybody knows how this works and, and um, how, to, how to deal with it. Um, and then um, actually to design a criteria that recognize uh, high standards of scientific integrity. And so this is a development of a metrics and a metric tool that would recognize research quality um, in, in, uh, in, in scientific manuscripts and, and other forms of, of research. So going forward, um, the group, um, I think being led still by ILSI and um, uh, National Academy of Sciences, uh, is to develop um, a, a further checklist and, and, and metrics. And this idea is uh, to have a checklist that would guide in the design, conduct, and reporting of studies. Of course, that's a task that is um, a challenge when you are looking at many, many, many types of, of studies. So there might uh, be a need for uh, overarching principles and then, and then a checklist that would be more specific to a, a discipline. Um, an objective tool for evaluation of public research and something that's already being used in some circumstances is a criteria that would be a stamp of approval that perhaps a study has undergone uh, an evaluation process that, that checks all of these boxes and that uh, would, would get a logo on it um, that, that would follow it, um, so some sort of stamp of, of approval. And then, uh, as I mentioned, metrics to measure um, scientific uh, integrity. So the next steps for the consortium, um, <clears throat> under pretty much uh, done, so after the manuscript was published, um, there was a, a campaign to share these principles and best practices, and this presentation today is part of uh, that campaign and maybe the last uh, of the presentations, so the box truly can be checked off as of right now. Um, there is an email um, address that was established, um, which is here, comments at uh, scienceintconsortium.com, uh, and so if anybody has comments or thoughts about this, um, uh, please feel free to, to send your email uh, along. And then um, working right now on a uh, checklist and metrics um, in collaboration with other organizations. And along that lines, um, in June of this year, uh, there was actually a, the sixth World Congress on Research Integrity. Um, 
in Hong Kong. I did not attend, but Allison did, and at least one other member of the consortium, I think Ricky Yada um, from University of British Columbia attended. And um, so this was, uh, the, they came up with the Hong Kong principles for assessing researchers and um, uh, new metrics for global adoption um, and to measure uh, scientific integrity, both of researchers and institutions. And so um, this is uh, very much in line, in alignment with um, the next steps that the consortium had um, uh, on their list. So with that, um, I'll say thank you. And again, with the e I'll leave the email up here um, for your consideration. And I think we are gonna go to a panel discussion now.